gonna go check outside, buddy. Okay? Okay. Oh man. I don't like it. Let's check on Blaze. Oh, come here, buddy. Are you crying? You want to leave? Okay. That's fine. Goodbye, Mr. Blaze. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly. First things first, I want to say a big thank you on the support on the recent Tri-State video. I spent a lot of time and effort in that one and I think it's paying off. You guys are really enjoying it and I've been getting great feedback. The members of this channel have actually already voted on the next topic that we're going to cover, which they have decided is going to be Mayfield. So keep your eye out for that one. It's going to be a heavier one. So today we're going to be talking about something a little bit lighter and something that I find really interesting and kind of fun to just explore. Of course, as always, I do have a Twitter and an Instagram if you all are interested and following what I'm doing on a more daily basis and some updates on the videos as they happen. You can find those links in the description below. And yeah, without further ado, let's just jump right into the video. Up until recent history, tornadoes have been an object of mystery, a particularly elusive and terrifying phenomena that brought death and destruction for reasons people couldn't quite figure out. So today we're going to examine the earliest and most intriguing depictions and perceptions of tornadoes throughout history, ones you'd only see in your wildest imagination. In order to discuss the earliest known perceptions of tornadoes and more largely natural disasters in Western and European culture, we of course have to take a look at the historical context that helped to shape them. Religion and superstition, particularly from the Christian lens, is going to play a huge role in today's discussion. So let's examine all of these perceptions of tornadoes throughout history from the earliest conceptions and depictions of tornadoes in the Western world, to Native American beliefs on tornadoes, and overall just how our perceptions of these beautiful and horrifying storms have changed over the years. It's impossible to point to exactly what the very first depictions of tornadoes were. These undoubtedly have stretched back for centuries and centuries. So we're going to start with the earliest, more reliable depictions in the 15th century from European literature and art. The Renaissance era and more specifically the later years of the Renaissance period were so important for meteorology because of the massive explosion of scientific discovery that was beginning to happen. But before the Renaissance period and this explosion of scientific discovery and the invention of quantitative measuring devices, weather features were used emblematically to convey philosophical or religious and political ideas in paintings and tapestries or in literature. They depict fear and uncertainty, an idea of what God's wrath might look like, 
wonder and fascination and so much more. The research I'm going to be using for this part of the discussion is largely from a piece of work called a Renaissance depiction of a tornado. I highly recommend you look through this yourself. If you're interested in this topic at all, it'll be linked in the description for you. The earliest depiction of a tornado that we're going to be looking at today comes from 1054 on April 30th in Ireland. Another one of the earlier depictions of tornadoes that I was able to find happened in August of 1165 during a thunderstorm in York. What was described as, quote, an enormous image of the devil himself on a black horse charging through the sky to the sea. The tracks of this horse were seen of enormous size imprinted on a mountain at the city of Scarborough. The depiction goes on to describe this black horse, the thick neck of the black horse being the funnel itself, and very interestingly, the legs also being described here in what I can only assume is possibly either a multiple vortices structure or even possibly a satellite tornado. Taking a deeper look now into the 15th and 16th century depictions of tornadoes, we have a depiction of a whirl of clouds that makes a hole in the heavens. Again, in this image specifically, you can really see that depictions of weather phenomena aren't based in science at all, rather heavily connected to personal superstition, belief, or religion. And this theme is going to really carry on for the majority of the 15th through 18th centuries until there is a lot more progression in the field of meteorology and there's a little bit better of an understanding of the intricacies of tornadoes. One of my favorite early depictions comes from Germany in the 16th century. On July 1st, 1587, a depiction of a tornado moving through Augustburg. The tornado is said to have gone through Augustburg between noon and 1 p.m. on July 1st and is described as having been accompanied with thunder, flashes of lightning, heavy hail, and of course wind. Interestingly enough, and probably one of my favorite parts about this story, is that the tornado was described as having been akin to a large dragon's tail moving around for half an hour. Moving right along to the 17th century, we have another depiction of a tornado in a children's book via 1658. This is yet another great example of how closely connected religion and calamitous weather are. In this time period, you have a sort of flashing light coming from what seems like the heavens shining down. You've got destruction happening. But there's definitely an undeniable element here of some sort of otherworldly presence, be it God or just some sort of divine intervention. It's not just the tornado itself. Moving into the 18th and 19th centuries, here we have imagery from July in 1751 in the Netherlands, an illustration and diagram of a developing tornado in stages. And immediately you can see the difference here is abundantly clear. This early depiction is really incredible because it's one of the first times we can actually see people start to have more of a scientific understanding of the formation of tornadoes rather than something that's just based in superstition or religion. So far we've examined a few centuries of early tornado depictions, but notably we've only done so from European art and literature. But at this point in history, European settlers have moved to the Americas and began taking over land. It's also at this point that they're about to discover that tornadoes are a lot more of a problem in the American Midwest and Great Plains than they were back in Europe. So of course, the new European settlers who are pushing their way west 
don't have a real understanding of these tornadoes, but the Native Americans, on the other hand, who have been in the Great Plains for hundreds and thousands of years before us, have a much better understanding and unique perspective on these storms. We've arrived at my favorite part of this video, the one I am most excited to talk about, and that is the Native American perceptions and beliefs on tornadoes in the Great Plains. While the perceptions of tornadoes, of course, are going to be different from Europeans to Native Americans at the time, even amongst different tribes, the depictions and beliefs and word for tornado itself is going to be different amongst every individual Native American tribe. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. I'm going to be talking about specific groups. The Lakotas, for example, saw the whirlwind as a message, carrying a spirit associated with dancing, games, and love. To them, these harmless little whirls were just daily sights and nothing to really be afraid of, but rather to be celebrated. On the contrary, many legends of other tribes speak of these storms as demonic or evil spirits, a source of a cleanse or a rebirth through destruction. And you'll notice that some of these themes are very much in line with the religious themes, particularly Christianity, that we've talked about earlier. When we try to understand tornadoes through the Native American perspective, we must look at it through their lens. A lens that shows us a world where animate and inanimate objects are indistinguishable. A world where every single thing, including tornadoes, has a spirit. So this is why the earlier depictions of tornadoes are described as being horses or snakes or any kind of powerful creature. They all have a spirit. They're all living. But overall, the Native Americans have long offered a more connected and unique perspective to the natural world than the religious ones of the European settlers. Much of this documentation comes from the Great Plains Silver Horn Calendar, which was first used in the year 1828. This calendar used depictions to portray the seasons for every year and what they experienced. One of the most interesting depictions we're going to talk about today comes from the year 1905, the year of the Great Cyclone Summer. It's in this year specifically that lies the depiction of a violent tornado's wrath. This illustration shows a powerful horse known as the Storm Maker Red Horse, a supernatural animal with the upper body of a great horse and the tail of a snake. The remains of the village show death and destruction left behind as the creature tears through it. In some instances, tornadoes or whirlwinds were even connected with prophecies. A Kiowa shaman prophesied the tribe renewal and cultural revival in the year 1888, where a mighty whirlwind would blow away the whites and all of the Indians who followed the whites' customs. And just for fun, I want to really quickly go over some of the preventative or protective measures that certain Native American tribes might take to avoid tornadoes because I think they're really interesting. The first one being to place a settlement on the junction of a river or rivers because it was believed that tornadoes couldn't cross over rivers. The second method of protection or preventative measure from twisters was that the nomadic groups would move north uh, during the prevalent periods of tornado activity from May to July would just move north to not only avoid twisters, but the heat as well, which is a really effective way to uh, avoid twisters. So we're talking about people who really knew the landscape, uh, knew the atmosphere and had been there so long that they knew the patterns of the weather and when twisters were most prevalent. The third method of protection we talked about briefly is based in myth, and it's what we talked about holding up sharp objects to the storm or the twister to try to slice or divert the storm as it approaches. Now, this is something you can find in multiple, multiple different folklore. I've actually read accounts of people who had grandparents who still practice this to either put a knife in the ground or hold up the edge of the knife to a storm and it's supposed to help move the storm away or split it. 
I'm really fascinated by this one. I think it's incredible. There's a lot of stories about this. I will link in the description if you want to read some of them. And the last one I'm going to briefly discuss, the fourth method of protection, if you will, is to talk the storms away. And if you are someone who is religious yourself, or maybe you grew up in a religious home like I did in the South, this is very similar to Christianity. I remember growing up in a house where my mom would want to pray the storms away. She would pray for God to divert the storms, that nobody would be hurt. And it's sort of, in a way, talking the storms away. In Christian belief, you are sort of speaking power over the storm. So I think this is a really interesting one because it's sort of universal. Uh, whether you are a Christian, whether you have some other sort of religion that believes in a divine entity, or whether you have Native American beliefs, or whether you're just superstitious, it's a sort of universal concept that you can kind of speak power to something. So I really like this one, actually. And overall, there is so much information to be had on Native American beliefs on tornadoes specifically. We don't have time to go over everything today, but I will link a lot of the resources in the description for you. This is one of the most fascinating topics to me, so feel free to leave me any of your personal anecdotes in the comments. I would love to read through them. And if you all want to see a more dedicated video on the topic with a lot more in-depth research, let me know and I think we can make that happen. Talking about Native American perceptions and beliefs around tornadoes is so important because once the European settlers come over, whether or not the Native Americans choose to share their knowledge on tornadoes in the Great Plains is going to directly impact how much the new settlers understand about tornadoes, their awareness of them, and how they were going to deal with those tornadoes. So whether or not the Native Americans chose to let the new settlers know about the violent twisters that are so prevalent in the Great Plains was going to be up to the Native Americans. Now, if you were being moved out of your homeland and pushed somewhere else, would you divulge that information to the new settlers? I would think not. Most Native American tribes, rightfully so, weren't forthcoming about their knowledge on tornadoes and their frequency in the Great Plains. It's documented that the Cheyenne people told the first European settlers of Woodward, Oklahoma in 1893 that tornadoes would not track along the nearby North Canadian River. This was said to have led to a false sense of security amongst the white settlers in the years leading up to the disastrous 1947 Woodward, Oklahoma tornado with deadly consequence. So the settlers were going to be left to their own devices to figure out very quickly the frequency and violence of the tornadoes that occurred every year around midsummer in the Great Plains. It's the late 19th century, now turning to the 20th century, and things are changing in big ways. Not only are the settlers much more familiar with the phenomenon of twisters, their behaviors, and how to understand them, photography is a booming business, and now for the first time ever, storms and tornadoes are actually being captured on film. Of course, capturing a tornado wasn't the first thing people were able to do when photography started to get popular because tornadoes are so incredibly elusive, but there had to be a first. And eventually there would be a photographer lucky enough or bold enough to capture a twister on film for the very first time. It's unclear specifically what the very first official tornado captured on film was, it's still a hotly debated topic, so we're going to take a look at a couple. The first image I'm going to show you is probably the most famous image of the proclaimed first picture of a tornado, and it comes from April 26th, 1884 by an unknown photographer over Howard, South Dakota. 
Again, this is the proclaimed very first image of a tornado, but there are a couple others we're going to explore as well. This image is so incredible because it portrays three funnels rather than just one, and it has a very eerie feeling about it. To my understanding, a lot of people have noted that this is likely an edited image in some capacity, uh, but it is the regarded first tornado picture in history. But it is hotly contested, so just putting that out there. But there is another image from 1884, actually. And this photo is taken by A.A. A. Adams, and this twister is in Garnet, Kansas on April 26th, 1884, which is actually the same day as the previous photo. To me, I really like this second image a lot more because it portrays a much more realistic image of a twister. You can see family homes in the picture. The funnel is gorgeous as well. And it was also shot by an amateur photographer who was just lucky enough to be able to get his camera out and set it up in time to capture this image. The funnel was noted to have had, quote, the appearance of a long rope of purplish gray color and the observers also noted that it sounded like a train. Adams later went on to sell souvenir cards and stenographs showing the image of the twister and was considered to be the first person to have taken a photograph of a tornado, at least by locals. A reporter from Anderson County the next day did a horseback survey of the storm and found it to be 15 kilometers in length. Property damage was light. I wish we still did horseback surveys today. So this one specifically comes from May 12, 1896. The McFarland Library at the University of Tulsa in Oklahoma has recently acquired this photograph of a tornado that hit Oklahoma City on May 12, 1896, taken by Thomas Croft. This twister was an F2 that struck four farms, destroyed one barn completely, killed some poultry, and tore the kitchen off of a farmhouse. And it's incredible how in 1896 in May Oklahoma City is still getting hit by tornadoes in this month I mean they can just not escape it it seems like and a couple of other images from Oklahoma City and North Dakota twisters which are just unreal and so at the beginning of the 20th century, it's with all of these really incredible photographs of tornadoes in combination with the progression of meteorology that we start to get a lot more of an accurate portrayal and perception and understanding of tornadoes in all their intricacies. Overall perception of twisters was starting to be founded in science rather than in religion or superstition. As we know, it's in the beginning of the 20th century that for the very first time in history, tornadoes actually start to be studied by John P. Finley, who would go on to create 15 rules for early tornado forecasting. We can also see at this point that the very classic American imagery and perception of tornadoes is really being solidified, which we can see in this portrait here from 1929. I think this is a very accurate portrayal of the sort of American idea of what a twister looks like. You've got the classic American family in uh, farmland, probably out in the plains somewhere. You've got the family going outside to shelter, a twister in the distance. This is almost as classic American uh, tornado folklore as it gets. Since the early 20th century, perceptions and myths surrounding tornadoes have continued to change before our very eyes. Events like the Tri-State Tornado and the Enigma outbreak really helped solidify to the average American the importance of tornado education and the importance of being weather aware. And this would continue on throughout the 20th century as major tornadoes and outbreaks would really shape Americans' lives and their perceptions of how dangerous these storms can be. And we really have to take a second to appreciate how far we've come over the years to learn about and understand and eventually appreciate these beautiful yet horrifying storms. 
And it's also important to point out that misconceptions and myths and religious beliefs surrounding tornadoes are still very prevalent today. They just look a little bit different than they used to. Inevitably, religion and superstition and fatalism are all concepts and beliefs that are going to be around no matter what. And that's okay. They help shape our worldview and really determine how we're going to perceive and understand and shelter from storms or not. And ultimately, that's up to each individual to decide. As someone who grew up in the South, I have been more than familiar with a lot of these superstitions and religious beliefs surrounding severe weather. Specifically, I remember having my parents and church pray over storms and bad weather. I have met so many people who have always said, well, it's God's time to take me home. So I've been exposed to that sort of fatalistic approach to life. I've seen a lot of these different myths and superstitions uh, with my own two eyes. And so I have found this specific conversation to be really intriguing. And I thought a lot of you could honestly relate to some of these things as well. Despite the fact that we have modern technology in 2023 and understand tornadoes than we ever have in history, misconceptions are still going to exist. Some people still think it's okay to shelter under an overpass. Some people still think that living next to a river protects them from tornadoes. And that's okay. We're... <laughs> that's not okay. <laughs> I'm just really thankful we're living in a time now where people are being a lot more weather aware and educated on things like how to read a radar and how to fully understand the threat level that you're in and how to properly shelter from storms. And I think that's just one of the most incredible things about having this channel and the fact that the weather space is kind of getting bigger and bigger. I'm really thankful for that. And, um... Yeah, I think that kind of wraps up this discussion. There's probably some lingering thoughts in there somewhere. Feel free to let me know how you thought about it in the comments. Um, if you liked today's video, please do give it a like for me. It does help me in the algorithm and subscribe if you haven't already. Go follow my Twitter and Instagram. Links are in the description if you want to see me there. And that's it. Yeah, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate you. And I will see you all in the next one. Bye. whirlwind <laughs> that was very country of me pee pee poo poo popping this is always how i do a microphone test anderson county the next day did a horseback survey of the storm and i wish we still did horseback surveys today i sound so stupid misconceptions are still going to exist some people still think it's okay to shelter under an overpass and that's okay we're <laughs> that's not okay <laughs> That is my Pringle. How long has this been over here? Oops. And that's okay. I'm just a person who has eye bags. <laughs>